Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying how, how honored I am to be here <laughs> and share with you some considerations about a subject that we, is a matter of concern for us all. I regret that I'm unable to speak to you in, in Dutch, but as I mentioned to the uh, people at the table, uh, I did spend some time in South Africa and at Kenna on Biggie Afrikaans Prat. But to deal with the subject at hand. The subject of, the, of this talk is the present day crisis uh, that we see everywhere. I mean, there is a crisis in the church, there's a crisis in the family, a crisis in education. But what I'd like to address today is a particularly grave part of that crisis, which is the crisis in the economy. It's no secret that the world economy is in trouble. Things aren't working the way they should be working. There is a failed leadership, fiscal irresponsibility, and excessive debt. And there's a sensation of being overwhelmed by the crisis. Uh, it's not proportional to our means. And so for many, it's not exactly clear how we should deal with this crisis. Uh, what exactly do we fight for? Where do we look for solutions? And these are questions that are addressed in the book, Return to Order, from a frenzied economy to an organic Christian society, where we've been, how we got here, and where we need to go. It's a book about economy, it's a book about moral values, but more importantly, it's a book about economy and moral values. Because that's what we need to do if we want to put both our society and economy back on course. Now, as a word of explanation, I, I, let me say that I started studying this subject back in 1986. I got involved when the founder of the first TFP, the Brazilian TFP, Professor Plinio Correia de Oliveira, invited me and five or six other Americans to study uh, economy, which he called the, very pragmatically called, the American Commission. We formed a study commission called it the American Commission. And Professor de Oliveira thought America and the West would one day uh, face, suffer a very great economic crisis caused by a frenzied economy. And he said we should study how Christian civilization dealt with these matters, and that we should develop a Catholic response to this, to the, to the problem. And so over the years, uh, we in the American Commission have studied this issue off and on, and in the last six or seven years, especially after the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis, uh, we engaged in a very uh, intense program of study. And the result is a book that highlights where we went wrong in our economy, and more importantly, points in the direction of, of solutions based on timeless Christian principles. And so in the, in the course of this talk, I would like to deal with three things. First, I would like to, to, to say where we went wrong in our economy, analyzing the roots of the present social economic crisis. Second, I'd like to present solutions by looking at what kind of society we should, we should want for ourselves. And finally, I'd like to explain how we can work toward a return to order. Now, regarding the crisis, let me begin by saying I think our problem is a profoundly spiritual problem, not only an economic problem. It's not just unemployment, it's not just deficit spending and central bank policies. It's not, it's, it's, it's not just godlessness or immorality. And these are all symptoms of a agitation deep inside the soul of modern men. We're in, the, we're in the present state not only because these problems have entered into our lives, but a lot of because of moral problems have been taken out, or moral issues have been taken out, moral values have been taken out. And so my thesis is that economic st instability just doesn't happen. We make it happen when we leave, when we abandon our, our, our moral values, institutions, and customs. An immoral society just doesn't happen. We make it happen when we sever ourselves from our Christian roots and our vital traditions. When these things are lost, we, the, the, uh, we ourselves open the door that allows a hostile culture to come charging in. We ourselves initiate a process where we start losing our freedoms, the economy starts to unravel, and our faith, the faith is destroyed in the souls of men. And so my thesis is that a root cause of what is happening in our economy is something I trace to a social economic cause. I, I trace it to the culture of instant gratification, 
what might be called a party economy that is very much what we have in our, our modern days. I mean, you think about it, people don't leave the faith today because they're tortured or are persecuted, at least not now. People leave the faith because they are taken up by a culture that promises them every pleasure right now and saying that everybody doesn't. Or think about it, we don't have a one-child policy that forces people to get abortions. Uh, but the general idea of a lot of people is, if you have the child, you'll miss out on the party. And so there's a term coined in the book, Return to Order, that describes this gratification. I call it frenetic intemperance. <coughs> Frenetic intemperance is a reckless and restless spirit inside certain sectors of modern economy that leads people to throw off legitimate restraints and gratify all desires. It creates an economy that is frenzied and out of balance. Now, I'm not talking about ordinary greed or ambition. We've always had that, and the free market can deal with it. I'm not talking about business drive to get things done in business. We need that if we're going to prosper. What I'm talking about is something that leads people to resent the very idea of restraint and scorn the spiritual, cultural, moral, and religious values that normally keep economy calm, that keep it in order. <coughs> I mean, you can see frenetic intemperance in action in, in frenzied markets, in newfangled investment instruments, and in high-risk derivatives found all over the world of commerce. You can see it in speculative bubbles like the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. You can see it in massive debt. It's, a, it's an almost irrational factor that enters into a lot of the business world. It sets the tone for the business world and it ends up destroying free markets. But where you and I can see this frenetic intemperance the most is in our daily lives. Our frenzied, uh, our frenzied schedules, our hectic lives, uh, the stress of our, 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 our lifestyles. Instant gratification is the order of the day. You know, we must have everything now, instantly, regardless of the consequences. It must be the biggest and the best. It must be 5.0, 6.0, 7.0. Consumers are encouraged to spend with the click of a mouse or the swipe of a cart. I, I saw an example of frenetic intemperance just the other day in the Wall Street Journal, where they talked about the need for presenting Twitter resumes and how you can reduce your whole life into a 140-character tweet. <laughs> Uh, politicians get involved in frenetic intemperance by engaging in all sorts of, of spending projects. Central banks use all sorts of tricks to mitigate the effects of frenetic markets. And we all look to our governments as the nanny of last resort to bail us out of our mistakes when things go wrong and hope that the problem will go away. But the frenzy just continues. To use a comparison, we can say that a, a free market economy like we have today a lot, of, a lot of countries have today, is a very healthy and robust human body. It can produce a lot, and it generates an enormous amount of wealth. But there is also a drug called frenetic intemperance that enters into the veins and wreaks havoc upon the systems. It can even stimulate the, the muscles to work more. It can even make the, the muscles hyperactive. But in the end, it creates an enormous imbalance in inside the economy that frequently causes the whole system to crash. And so this frenzied system and its constant crashes mark the history of modern economics. If you study the history of modern economics, you see that there, it is a history constantly filled with these crashes, these manias, these panics. And as times go on, these crashes become ever bigger and more dangerous. Noriel Robini and Stephen Ming, they wrote a book called Crisis Economics, and they claimed that, quote, crises are the norm, not the exception. That's not to say all the crises are the same, far from it. The particulars may vary from one to another, but in general, crises are the norm of modern economics. Or as Melvin King, who was the, just the last governor of the Bank of England, he wrote in, in 2010, he says, banking crises are endemic to, uh, to the market economy that has evolved since the Industrial Revolution. The words banking and, crisis and, and crises are natural <coughs> that fellows. So for a long time, modern economy has, it has survived these crashes and, and, and crises. But now the problem is taking, about, taking on monstrous proportions. Our problem is that this drug of frenetic intemperance is dominating our economy and society. It's setting the tone. It's, it's tearing our economy and society apart. It's eroding our faith. 
We've turned parts of our economy into a party economy that never seems to stop. We've, become, we've built up credit card nations with ever-increasing spending limits and monthly payments. So it doesn't surprise me that we need to infuse huge amounts of capital and quantitative easing into our, fix, our frenzy markets just to keep the party going. It doesn't surprise me in this state of, of things that the human element so essential to, mo to modern economy, or to any type of economy, to the proper functioning of society and, and economy is diminished. And in this, in this context, money becomes the, the, prime, the most important consideration. It rules. Modern economic activity becomes cold and impersonal, mechanical and inflexible. It also becomes full of all sorts of inhuman rules and regulations, because the governments try to somehow rein in this frenzy, and they create a parallel frenzy of, of right rules and regulations. Just to give you an example, not from the European Union or the United States, but from the United Kingdom, they, they, they published a, uh, they have a regulatory handbook for the Financial Services Authority. And this regulatory handbook has ten sections in it. And the section titled Prudential Standards is divided into eleven subsections. And the subsection Prudential Sourcebook for Banks, Building Societies, and Investment Firms is made up of fourteen <coughs> sub-subsections. And the sub-subsection market risk is divided into 11 sub-sub-subsections. And the sub-sub-subsection of interest rate has 66 paragraphs. Uh, this rule book of 1.1 million paragraphs is described by the NSA as a light touch, principle-based regulation. I'm sure we'd have no problem finding other examples in Washington or Dodd-Frank bill. Our Dodd-Frank finance a law has 30,000 uh, 30, pages of regulation. And I'm sure that in Brussels they have plenty of others that supply uh, other uh, similar type uh, bills and regulations. Well, in return to order, I make the case the present party economy is unsustainable. And I'm not alone in this assessment because there are literally hundreds of books in America and Europe that are saying the same thing. Uh, we have exhausted our social capital that is found in family, community, and faith that normally sustain and balance economy. Frenetic intemperance is taking on multi-trillion euro proportions that are beyond our ability to deal with it. I mean, for those who wish to see, we're heading toward a storm. We can debate the details of when the party will stop, or what will trigger the next, the next crisis, what will be the next bubble. But I make the case in my book that this is not a question of if the party will stop, but rather when it will stop, and where we will go. Our problem is to declare the party's over, before it's too late. If it's about keeping the party go going, well, the return to order really isn't your book. If that's what you want, then by all means, let's keep borrowing, let's keep infusing easy money into, into markets, putting off the day of reckoning. But if you want a return to order, let's look for ways to, to free, to liberate economy from the slavery of frenetic intemperance. Let's talk about the kind of society we need and want when the party stops. And so that leads me to the second part of, of my talk. What is our response? What is the Christian response? What are the, where are the solutions? And in fact, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, you know, is, is uh, uh, exactly that. How do you fight all this? Uh, is it possible, given the fact that it's so huge? What concrete steps can I take? Uh, show me the way to do, it, to do it, and do it quickly. I don't have a lot of time. Well, I can sympathize with those who ask that question. Concrete economic problems need concrete economic solutions. But when people ask me, what can we do to fight this crisis, I respond with another question, saying, well, where do you want to go? I mean, too, too many times we know where we don't want to go. We don't want socialism. We don't want overregulation. We don't want massive debts. But at times it's clear, it's, it, it's, it's clear where we don't want to, where we want to go. We, it's, not, it's unclear where we want to go. So if we were in a position to change things all of a sudden, we really wouldn't have a positive program to offer. The problem, the question we need to be asking, asking right now is, what kind of society and economy do we want and need when the party stops? And so the book, Return to Order, attempts to answer this very important question. It affirms that what is being destroyed in our postmodern economy 
is a framework of ordering principles that normally keeps economy in, uh, or orienting principles that normally keeps economy in balance. And that, that, that framework is called order. Russell Kirk said it best when he said, order is the first need of the soul. Without order, one cannot be free. Freedom, justice, law, virtue are all very important, but without order, one cannot survive. It is the first and most basic need. Without a framework of order, the influence of important institutions like the family, the community, church, cannot naturally serve as breaking mechanisms to diminish the effects of frenetic intemperance and facilitate the practice of virtue. And so the answer to the question is very, our, our question is very simple. We want to go back to a framework of order. And so we need an order, but not just any order. There are all sorts of people out there proposing orders. Socialist orders, green orders, red orders, ecological orders, neo-fascist orders. And so many of them promise order, yet deliver tyranny. That's why we must return to order. We don't have to invent an order. It already exists. It's nothing new. It's a, it's a social order that comes from our human nature itself and is valid for all times and all peoples. It's a social order that is not imposed or legislated into existence, but always emerges when people resolve to unite in search of the common good. It's an order based on the <coughs> principles of natural law, the Ten Commandments, and rooted in the social institutions of family, community, and faith. And although it applies to everyone, the church is its best and most secure guardian. And so our proposal is, is simple and straightforward. The best expression of this order is found in what I call an organic Christian order. It's the same order that gave rise to Christianity. <coughs> this organic order is the society is a return to our distant roots. It's where we came from. It's a society that historically existed in Christendom. It involves not returning to an historic past, reset, set, going, uh, turning back the clock, it, it, but rather a return to a set of ordering principles that brought us so many of the institutions that we need so much today and which are now fading, like the rule of law, or representative government, traditional family, and the principle of subsidiarity. It is an organic order, what the sociologists call an organic order. It's a very flexible society that resembles a human body and not a machine of interchangeable parts. An organic society and its corresponding economy is a refreshing contrast to a modern society. It's not a system. It's like a family, full of vitality and spontaneity, nuance and meaning, poetry and passion. In an organic society, honor, not money, rules. And it is a Christian order. Some people ask, well, why do you want a Christian order? It's because when an organic order is Christian, it multiplies the possibilities of our action because we include God and His grace in partnership. It makes it easier to practice virtue, especially the, the carnal virtues, which are very economical virtues, of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. It lays the foundation for, for true progress and prosperity. And so in Return to Order, I, I, I've sought to describe this forgotten order that existed in Christendom. I try to explain how, under the influence of church teaching, problems similar to our own were resolved in the past, and that might, well, we might do the same today. And as Professor Plinio Correa de Veda recommended, I have especially focused on the economy by outlining the church on the economy by outlining the church teachings on these matters. I've sought to describe what an organic society and, and, and a corresponding economy might look like. Now, I must admit, when I started researching what the church teaches about economy, I was amazed about what I found. I never imagined I'd find such solutions based with such common sense and wisdom. Of course, things were, back, were a bit different back then. For one thing, the economists were saints, like St. Antonine, St. Bernardine of Siena, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, among others. There was also a, a, the Salamanca School of Economics, which counted among its members some learned and virtuous men. And so the, the church's economic teachings were intertwined with its moral teachings, but they were incredibly, surprisingly efficient, economically sound, and led to prosperity. In my research, for example, I found uh, descriptions by, uh, actually by a Norwegian Protestant professor 
of the uh, economic effects of the sacrament of confession. I found the re a theory of just price that gives balance to markets. There are all sorts of authors that explain the tranquilizing effects of a passion for justice and the emphasis on true charity. When you put all these things together, you get a general picture of what, of, of where we need to go. Now, we, have, we all have vague notions of, of, of this organic Christian society, because there are remnants of family, honor, faith that survive it, uh, today. You see them all around. But these remnants alone are not enough to stem the tide of broken families, shattered communities, and empty churches. We desperately need a return and regeneration of this order, this, this order. It is where we need to go, because there is no other place to go save disorder. And so to those who ask, well, what can we, how can we return to order, or what can we do to return to order, I respond, let's first agree on where we must go, toward an organic Christian society. And once that's done, you'll be surprised how much easier it is to get there. That brings us to our final point. How do you return to return? How do you re you, we return to order? Someone might object, you know, it's certainly a very nice place, you, that organic Christian society is a nice place to go. But given the present circumstances, it's simply not realistic or practical. Uh, how, how do you get there? You can't just call up Ben Bernanke or, or Janet Yeller or Christine Lagarde and say, stop all this quantitative e easing nonsense and let's build an organic Christian society. No, they certainly won't listen. However, there is something we can do to, <coughs> what, we, what we can do is warn the public about the present economic crisis and situation of frenetic intemperance and how it is unsustainable. We can be like passengers in a cruise ship, navigating troubled waters, and declare the party's over. We can do everything possible to diminish the disastrous effects of frenetic intemperance upon society. And when the party stops, we can present an organic Christian society as a valid alternative. In fact, an alternative much more valid than the, than the socialist, ecological, and anarchical alternatives that are being proposed by others. It's an alternative that has a proven record and it needs to be put back on the table. When the party stops, we don't want to be left empty-handed. However, we don't have to wait till the party stops. There are plenty of things we can do to hasten and work toward a return to order. We can prepare now for the kind of society we need and want when the party stops. However, I warn you that it involves a grueling war against a culture of death and instant gratification. There are no instant solutions in this culture war. There's no, no app you can download. Rather, they're just the blood, sweat, and tears that are characteristics of any serious conflict. And so I'd like to, at this point, just to be a little more practical, list five things you might do. Uh, the first piece of advice I would offer is this, that identify and fight the problem. Don't flee from it. You know, in the face of the crisis, resist the temptation just to say, well, I'm just going to forget about it. I'm going to, to go to some remote place, write off the rest of the world, and go at it alone. The crisis is so generalized that no one can go at it alone. Uh, it will reach us one way or the other, whether it be by government action, by the media, or by iPhone. Many of you, uh, well, it, there's no, really no way to, to, uh, to, to, to avoid it. Uh, at a certain point, we have to fight the culture. At a certain point, we must embrace this fight. And so what I've sought to do in Return to Order is to identify the problem and offer suggestions for a solution. Professor Pnei Rivera, in giving advice for the writing of Return to Order, has said that asking the right questions is 50% of the solution. I would say identifying the problem and pointing the direction, right direction of the solutions is 50% of the condition for victory. The second thing I might, you might do in this, in, 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 to, uh, you might do is to withdraw from the party economy. So many times I hear people say, you know, we, what, can, what can one person do? You know, the other side controls the media, they've got the universities, they have the banks, they have this and that. We don't control anything, and there's really nothing a person can do in the face of the crisis. Now, I would reply, that's not exactly true. One thing you do control is yourselves. Why not start there? And so, withdrawal from the party economy. <laughs> note I say, uh, note I say as, as, as uh, I, I, I did not say, as a lot of people are saying, that we should withdraw from society. Or we should get off the power grid, 
or immerse ourselves in Franciscan poverty. No, stay in society, keep your job, but withdraw from the party economy. We all participate in our culture of instant gratification. We can all look at things in our own lives and change. We can close the door that allows our hostile culture to enter into our lives and create disorder. And that means eliminating certain habits and lifestyles, for example, spending beyond our means on fads and fashions, making unwise or reckless investments, showing reluctance to shave safe for the future, worshiping at the, the altar of speed with rush, rush schedules, allowing the, the frenzy of technological gadgetry to dominate our lives and thought processes, uh, judging the rule of money more important than family, community, <coughs> and religion. We are all in control of ourselves. At least we can do this. One of the gratifying things about <coughs> writing Return to Order are those who have read the books, the section about frenetic intemperance, and have told me they've changed their lives as a result. Third thing we might do is regenerate our intermediary bodies. That is to say, we all belong to intermediary groups like this, like this one, that are our best defense against a hostile culture and an intemperate economy. We, uh, the, 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 of course, the first intermediary body is the family. Uh, the family is the, is, is, uh, is the thing we should defend, is defend in the public square. Involve, and it involves engaging in the battle for this most important Christian institution. There's no substitute for the institution of the family to survive in our modern world. The family serves as a powerful and affectionate social safety net. It is a natural school of temperance in a world of intemperance. <coughs> the family is where you naturally go, where you naturally turn in times of crisis. And the same can be said to a, to a, to a lesser extent to communities and other associations. Communities are an important line of defense that we should develop. And this extends to any close-knit association, parish, uh, cultural group that form a, a community life. An organic Christian society is a, is a highly associative society, full of links and connections. It's contrary to our mass society that discourages the close-knit community and encourages extreme individualism. The third thing we must do I, I, is regarding the church. We, uh, I deliberately separated the church from the other associations because it is very special. If you want to do something in face of the present crisis, be good Christians. As, and as the book is written from a Catholic point of view, I say, be good Catholics. It's the most important means at our disposal. Uh, uh, we, it is the most, most practical step to implement. The church puts at our disposal so many assets. If we are to practice temperance in a world of phonetic intemperance, we need God's grace and sacraments to allow us to, to participate in the divine life of Christ and strengthen us beyond our human means. Uh, the church is a, uh, an organization that is a powerful advocate, and she has a hallowing influence upon society that prevents the ruin of a nation. Uh, the church is always stirred up against the errors and abuses of the times, and we have the martyrs to prove it. And so we need to put this also at our disposal. The fifth thing we might do is, is uh, I, I put, is it takes leadership. I say leadership for last because it is a very key ingredient. We need to be what some sociologists call representative characters, people who step up to the plate, people who, who look up to pe people who, who other people look up to who can translate what others need into action, who can unify and set the tone. The problem is that real leadership is hard. A leader, a leader is not someone who says, here I am, follow me. He's someone who earns the respect of those around him. And people want to follow him because he takes upon himself the welfare of others. He's full of responsibility and suffering. It's much easier to go with the flow of things. It's much easier to look after your own affairs. It's, there is a prevailing, I don't want to be a hero mentality out there. And what makes, what makes it worse is that modern culture encourages, uh, discourages the idea of representative characters and encourages unrepresentative characters in the form of film stars and jet set figures. So we need to be the opposite. Everyone here can be someone you could be, could, people can look up to. Everyone can be a hero to someone, even if it's just in your own family or just in your own, own small group. You don't have to win a medal, but it does take effort. 
And what we, do, what, we want, what we we also do not want a single charismatic leader, charismatic character leader. That's the easy way out that often ends up in disaster. What we need to do is generate a culture of heroes on all levels of society. And so we should think of ways in which we can be truly representative figures to those around us. In this way, we can reweave a strong and trusting social fabric and return to order. There's an interesting thing about leadership. I, I was just reading when I was doing my research. Uh, a lot of the things I mentioned, you know, things you should do, family, uh, community, these things take time. They take a lot of time to develop, sometimes even generations. And I've heard so many people say, we're not going to change the situation that we're in now in my generation. It'll only be later on, you know, when, when things get really bad or later, generations ahead. But with good leaders and heroes, it's different. It doesn't take a huge number or even a lot of time. When they enter into the scenes and the sociologists that I was researching, they said this, it doesn't take long, you don't need a lot. They can, they can take things and turn them around quite quickly. I'm sure you've seen cases of businessmen who've turned a company around, or a parish priest who turned a parish around, or a soccer coach who takes an underdog team and makes, him, makes it into a national champion. That's why it's important that we generate a culture of heroes. Because a return to order is not going to happen all by itself. People have to be involved. We need this culture of heroes to get things done, and get things done quickly. Well, these are a few of the ideas that come from my book, uh, that I hope will help, give you, help you improve your idea of where, what, where we went wrong in our economy, and the conviction that there are solutions on the other side. And so to summarize what I have said, I have endeavored in the course of this talk to answer two questions. Why are we in crisis? And what kind of society do we need and want when the party stops? And I saw I've mentioned two things, uh, two main points. The first is the present <coughs> crisis. We're in the present situation because we've embraced a culture of un unrestraint that I call frenetic intemperance. And which has eroded so many of the cultural, religious, and moral values which we need to be virtuous and prosperous people once again. And the second, we saw where we need to go. We must return to order. We don't have to invent an order. It's a social order that comes from our very human nature itself, valid for all times and all people, and with the church as its best and most secure guardian. We saw how the best expression of this order uh, is found in what I, what I call an organic Christian society, the same order that gave rise to Christendom. And finally, we looked at some of the things that might be done right now to hasten and prepare for a society, the kind of society we need and want when the party stops. Now, I imagine there are several here that are, that are skeptical about the idea of a return to order. It's really hard to see how something like this might work. I mean, if, and if there is one thing that I, one thought I would like to leave with you all, it would be this: that a return to order is not only necessary <coughs> but possible. Return to order is possible because our ideas are attractive. What we have to remember is that our, our position is by its nature constructive, and the leftist agenda is by its very nature destructive, it, because it undermines morality and authority. <coughs> because the left tends to destroy the structures that keep society together as time goes on, and, as time, and, and the breakdown worsens, the, ne the left is naturally destroying the structures of its own organization and thought. Uh, you only need look at the Occupy Wall Street movement that was so anarchical it couldn't get its act together and just literally disintegrated. A lot of, uh, a lot of leftist thought is really not thought anymore. Uh, it's, it's simply ratings. I mean, if you, if you have been on campus or in places or, uh, on the streets trying to defend uh, a moral position, more often than not, the arguments are not arguments, but simply uh, shouting and uh, uh, obscenities, etc. They really don't get involved in a lot of the arguments that they once did in the past. And as things get worse, our perspective looks much better than theirs, since it is this, uh, a force of stability and certainty. You can see this in a lot of conservative actions all over the world. A particularly strong proof of this is the number of young people who have been involved in the, in the fight against abortion. You can see this in other things, of conversion stories, of, of growth in, in, in vocations. Uh, it wasn't that way 10 or 20 years ago, so I think we must stand our ground. 
But there is another reason why I believe a return to order is possible. Is that the Christian ideas that motivate a return to order are extremely powerful. If they are presented correctly and unapologetically. An organic Christian society is an enormously powerful, has, is full of enormously powerful concepts that capture the imagination and have moved men to sublime feats and work. These same ideals echoed amid the ruins of the Roman Empire. They converted the barbarians, they established civilizations. They have always called men back to sanity when they have gone astray. And what I've sought to do in Return to Order is to describe these same very powerful concepts. I present ideas like the way of the cross, the passion for justice, the quest for the good, the true, the beautiful, the sense of honor. I maintain that these principles can still move men to, to similar feats amid the present crisis. And moreover, I maintain that the power and attraction of our Christian ideas is such that we naturally turn to them because we are so perfectly suited by our human nature to them. We tend to gravitate toward them when disorder rules. This Christian order inspired by these ideas is where we naturally tend to go. And I would take it one step further saying that not only do people naturally gravitate to this organic Christian society, but in the midst of the present crisis and chaos, some people are now gravitating toward this order. As things get worse, more and more people are searching, or soul-searching, looking for an order that they sense once existed and might yet return. I mean, across the globe, you find these things, this, 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 that there are many of those looking for authenticity and order. I'm not saying they're a majority, but history is never decided by majorities. It's decided by impassioned minorities that influence, have great influence over the majority. And there are sizable minorities out there with great passion and courage who dare to defy the culture and say enough. And we must be beacons of those who are searching. I'll bring this up an example of, of I'll just close with a little story of our student action uh, outreach. We have a university student outreach that uh, reaches people that camp on campuses. And many times uh, we get involved in, in very hot issues and uh, are very often attacked. This is particularly true in the same-sex marriage debate that is very hot in America. And we, we have the tendency to go to some of the more liberal areas and campaign there. And we, we are often attacked by thought bottles, rocks, you name it, they, they throw anything or everything at us. But more surprisingly, we are more often supported. One time we went to the Bronx, which was in New York City, it uh, was a Dutch neighborhood at one point. Uh, it was next to a, a busy highway, and, and uh, we were, pro we were, pro we were uh, uh, campaigning in favor of traditional marriage. And uh, we were greeted by all sorts of, of manifestations of support, people honking, people shouting their support, people giving the thumbs up. And one man saw us, and he parked his car, and he came up to us and saying, look, wait a minute, I want to see if I got this right. You're for traditional marriage, right? I saw so many people supporting you, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was the only person in the Bronx in favor against same-sex marriage. Now I see there are thousands. And so our role is now is to be beacons of order in a world of disorder. We have very powerful principles. Sometimes all it takes is a spark, and you have a million people in the Champs-Élysées in favor of traditional family in 2013 or a vibrant pro-life stand, and suddenly and unexpectedly you have tens of thousands of people uh, united in the streets of Brussels, Paris, Madrid, Rome, uh, De Hague, I heard also, uh, in 2013. Zero abortion in Spain held 46 rallies just two weeks ago. The same stand for principles can uh, move people to collect nearly two million signatures to support the One of Us initiative. Or it could move young people to gather 750,000 signatures in Croatia in defense of traditional marriage in two weeks. Uh, I've looked with admiration at these European initiatives, and such efforts reinforce my belief that a return to our order is possible if we do what we should do. But this, this, this vision is, is, can only be powerful to the extent, to the degree, that we are faithful to our principles. We cannot dilute or adulterate our, our, our values 
to cater to politically correct times. In a very categorical way, the Spanish uh, uh, have a pro-life uh, campaign called zero abortion, not 50% abortion. And not to be outdone, the French, recognizing the universal appeal of marriage, called for a manif pour tout and not a manif pour quelques -on. If we look for the easy way out, we will fail. Now there's one final reason why I believe a return to order is possible, and for me, it's the most compelling. And it is that we can count on the grace on God and His grace. I never tire of saying how the West in general. In the situation of the West is like that of the prodigal son. If you read the story of the prodigal son, you'll remember that he, he took his father's riches and then spent them on the frenetic intemperance of parties and, and games. And what brought about the conversion of the prodigal son was not a moral problem, but an economic one. He ran out of money, and he had no way to live. <laughs> and a great famine came over the land at the same time. And it was at that point, the prodigal son said, realized the error of his ways, and he had longings for his father's house. And he rose up, and came, as St. Luke says, and came to the father. Now, in the story of the prodigal son, we all know that the son longed for his father, but we, most people don't forget that the father longed much more for his son. In fact, he went to the tower and looked to the horizon, waiting for, looking for signs of his son. And when he saw his son arrive, he ran out to meet him and, and, and did everything possible to, for his return. And so we must be convinced that God desires our grand return home much more than we do. And when he finds the least effort on our part, he has not outdone in his generosity, and he won't favor us in our endeavors. So it is my hope that in the midst of the, <coughs> the economic problems that we, we face individually, and the economic crisis that threatens to come upon our lands, the book Return to Order serves to awaken in you longings for our Father's house and compel you to rise up and join together with others to change the culture and come to the Father. And, uh, it, to come to the Father. It is my hope that you will hear, adhere to those powerful and attractive ideas that calls us to do what really comes naturally to us, to return home. Thank you very much. The gold standard is one of the um, one of the main pillars of the Austrian school, and uh, I have really no problem that there be money that be, be that is made in gold. Uh, in the research, uh, in the research uh, in the past in Christian civilization, uh, there was no gold minted in the Middle Ages. The first king to mint gold was Saint Louis the King. But um, there was there was always the problem in the in the in the later Middle Ages in the Renaissance that they had periods of what they called the bullion famines, and at, at, at key periods in time economic history, all of a sudden there wouldn't be enough gold. And it created enormous problems. It stopped economies, and and uh, I think it is one of the, one of the problems with the gold standard is that. At a certain point, there might not be, didn't be enough gold. There were always also, at the same time, people who manipulated the price of gold. When they found out that the, the mentors needed gold, all of a sudden the price would go up and it would cause, cause a lot of problems. Uh, you know, it's, it is a, there are a lot of problems with the gold standard. Even the 19th century gold standard, which people uh, cite as the ideal uh, gold standard, uh, most, a lot of authors, I'm not saying mo uh, all of them, but a lot of authors says, say that the gold was actually not there, at least parts of it, enough to, to support the economy. I, I believe, that, uh, ideally speaking, that uh, money, uh, when you take the frenetic intemperance out of an economic system, uh, the problem of money will be much easier to resolve. You won't need nearly as much. You don't need this constant expansion and, and detraction, uh, contraction of money supply. It makes it much easier to resolve this problem. And also, there were times in the past where um, different things served as money, so that um, gold served as pretty much the universal coinage, and other coinages would, uh, <coughs> uh, served 
silver or other things uh, served as, other, as a local or national currencies that uh, made it easier for economies to adjust. <coughs> you know, like today we have one big euro or one big dollar. Uh, it's, it doesn't allow uh, for the adjustment of the local economies. So I just read a paper somewhere sometime this, this week and that someone said, we don't have one euro, we have 17. <laughs> because it's hard for, for the euro to be all things to everyone and people necessarily suffer. So money should be flexible. It should be an expression of the culture of people. Uh, it really doesn't happen that way today. Yes? Yes? Uh, that, uh, the culture changed, changed so much that we now uh, have a sculpture of instance classification. What, when, when did this happen? What process was behind it? In, in the book, we talk about, uh, talk about the process. This is, is, it deals with the uh, economy. And um, I trace the, um, the, let's say, the domination of frenetic contemporaries to the time of the Industrial Revolution. That um, I'm not against industry or technology or progress. But at that time, there entered a, a certain factor into the economy that, that called for an, an enormous expansion of capital and contraction of capital, and it, it turned things upside down. Uh, I said that it could have happened in a much easier way, probably in a much more prosperous way, had it been done with temperance. And that's, that's where I trace it. Of course, in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it, it's almost medieval, according to our standards. As time has gone on, especially with you now with uh, all the internet and things, the globalization, I mean, this, this process, this frenetic intemperance is much more intense and reaching the point that, uh, an unsustainable point. So that's how I, where I, where I trace it. Yes? Yes, I have uh, the most part of your lecture, and I heard you talking about temperance a lot, but how do you measure temperance? Where is the beginning, where is the ending? How do you... Okay, yeah. <laughs> And especially since temperance has a bad name because it, uh, it doesn't treat beer quite well. <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm not for that type of temp. Uh, well, we should drink temperately, but I'm not, not to finish with all beer drinking. Uh, but temperance is the virtue by which one's, uh, one controls one's passions according to reason. That's the simple definition of temperance. And uh, a normal economy does that. It, it's, it's a... Uh, a a normal economy, a free market economy, a truly free market economy, allows the person to deal with all his, his passions, his needs, etc., in a very rational way and to keep them under control. When, when I talked about frenetic intemperance, I talked about certain tendencies in, in certain sectors of modern economy that <coughs> tend to uh, just throw off the restraints of reason, throw off the restraints of the markets, and, and simply indulge in create problems, panics, crashes, and, and, and that type of thing. So the intemperance in this case would be those types of things, those, those things that are pretty much a characteristic of modern economy from the Industrial Revolution to our days, and which several people you know, mentioned. So that, that, that would be, is that pretty much what you wanted, or would you want something a little more? I don't know, actually, because in modern world, the scale of things became so big. Right. So how, how do you how do you draw lines? I'm not, I'm not one to say, you know, that you, uh, you know, up to a billion dollars and everything, just, you know, put it down. There, there are a lot of people who say, well, we should create physic, uh, concrete limits to uh, enterprises, uh, to corporation sizes, and things of that nature. Uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work because once you start doing that, uh, people get greedy. They start limiting more and more and more until you get down to almost nothing. Uh, there is, uh, but when you do practice temperance, there is a certain um, ability for businesses, for economy to uh, develop in a very natural way so that when it reaches a certain size, uh, that people sense that that size is, is perfect. Any bigger, it becomes more inefficient. Any smaller, it becomes also inefficient. That there are even business schools that talk about efficient size. And that's, in a, in a regime of temperance, I think this would, would pretty much kick in, that you would have, you can have big companies, you can have big farms, you can have big economic enterprises, but um, not, not uh, that it would, the, the, the natural regulating uh, influences of family, community, faith would do a lot to keep that, to, keep, to draw the lines where you, you would want them to be.